Our guest in this segment is Delegate John Hardy, who hopes to be Commissioner John Hardy at some point. John, good morning. I'm just happy that this campaign season is going to be over soon for many reasons, but I'm afraid you guys are all going to be diabetics and be on a <laughs> if this thing goes too long. <laughs> the thought has been proffered, John, but uh, rest assured, we, we do use, other than the Admiral, we do use some discretion in terms of number of sweets consumed. And, yeah, well, you know, this this year the uh, the sign game has been strong, and the mailer game has been insane. I have saved every mailer. Uh, Sally started saving them for me in January when I was in Charleston, and I have saved every mailer that I've received. And I just I go through the I call it my uh, evening propaganda, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with all of them, but I'm telling you, it is a whale of a stack. Yeah, it's also a well of a negative stack, too, John. Have you ever seen the level of negativity that we've had in this particular uh, race no, this, this season? This, this, this is definitely one of the meanest, um, nastiest elections that I've seen. Uh, Republican on Republican crime. Um, just, you know, just candidates really going after each other. I've even gotten a few mailers where, you know, I thought, wow, this is, this is a little over the line. Even, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a negative guy. I've never been a negative mailer or a negative ad on anybody. I don't like it. I don't think it works. I don't think it works in smaller elections, maybe in the larger elections. I don't think in your more community-based elections, I don't think they're uh, – I don't think they work well, especially the ones that come from third-party uh, activist groups or PACs. Uh, but, yeah, this, this election has been very nasty. John, you wanted to comment. I don't want to go too far down that path there because I know there were some other things you wanted to comment on, John, but one of those was uh, in regards to this education discussion we were having. Well, you know, when, I, when the news broke about what was happening at the, at the middle school over there, I, I, I first was angry. Uh, I went through a kind of a, a bit of emotions about being angry and then, and then just very sad uh, that this is the situation that's going on and, and trying to figure out and understand what, you know, can be done for Berkeley County schools and West Virginia schools. And, you know, and I've had a lot of thought about this, about what I think needs to happen. And I, and I think there's a couple things that need to happen. I will tell you that your delegation from the Eastern Panhandle has been screaming, not, not just saying, but screaming in Charleston that, that Berkeley County schools needs help. Jefferson County schools needs help. We are in a very unique situation. Uh, if you think about Berkeley County schools hiring over 200 new teachers a year, every year, no continuity of service. You know, we're a training ground for young teachers. Uh, young teachers come in and maybe work one or two years, three years in Berkeley County, and then they're gone. So you, you're, you're not really building that core group of teachers. I know a few uh, teachers that are longtime teachers that have left Berkeley County for pay uh, and for other reasons. And, and, and pay is not just the root of it. Uh, there's, you know, there's lots of uh, uh, issues with behavior and, and respect issues. Uh, but I, I, I think that it's at a, at a crisis point where Charleston and whoever the next governor of the state is, is going to have to get involved to say that Berkeley County and Jefferson County and some of our other growth counties are in a unique situation and something is going to have to be done to help those counties uh, retain more teachers and keep the teachers that they have to start building some type of continuity of service. Those are all fair points, John. Uh, you've heard some candidates on this program over the last couple of months talk about uh, going to Charleston, uh, standing on their ground, uh, not there to make friends, there to get a job done. Uh, I think most of you, when you campaign your first time, state many of the same things. What's the reality of what you get when you go to Charleston if you plan on being an island down there? Well, it, you, you will accomplish nothing. I mean, politics is a team sport. As much as people want to say that they are, you know, principled and stand on their own and do what they want, it, politics is a team sport. Uh, it's full of compromise. It's full of, um, you know, the, the, you are always working with others that have different views uh, than you, and, and some, sometimes you end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, we, we've gotten closer on locality pay. I, I don't know if it ever really – passes as a standalone piece of legislation, if it will be built into more of a uh, situation where it will be uh, like we did with the jails and prisons and we did with social services where we, um, you know, where we had to put that into legislation as to, uh, you know, where, where they could 
have critical pay access and those type of things. John, we're getting toward the end of the campaign season. Uh, are you? Would you handicap some of the races for us? For example, the governor's race. Would you handicap that race? How, how do you no. say? It? Bill, I have I have worked very very hard to stay extremely quiet in all the races. Uh, I'm 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 really not interested in giving my views on any of the races. I have some very strong views, but I'm not interested in making those public. I am very. Uh, locked into winning my county commission race and being the absolute best county commissioner that I can be for Berkeley County. And I, you know, have to be careful because I'm going to have to work with a lot of these people. Uh, you know, there could be some, some shakeups in the Senate races. There could be, I don't know who the next governor is going to be. There could be delegates that are going to change. And so I'm being very careful about who I may have to work with in the future uh, because we all know that it's all consensus building, and you may have to do business with people that you may not agree 100% with their politics. So I've worked very hard to stay very quiet in this election cycle. Let me ask one question a little bit differently then, so I'll not ask you to handicap. Are there certain races that you're surprised of being closer than you would have initially thought they would be? Yeah, I'm surprised the governor's race is as close to it as it is. I figured with Patrick Morrissey being a three-time elected state official and uh, the money at his hands that he would have clearly pulled ahead in that race. He seems to be stuck in that kind of 32 to 36 percentile. Uh, you know, you do have the Capito machine uh, behind the young Moore Capito helping in his race. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little surprised at, at that race, how, how tight that it's going to be. How about a couple of local Senate races, the 15th and the 16th? Are you surprised how they're taking shape? Yeah, I don't really care to comment on any of those. Um, but, uh, yeah, the governor's race is, is very intriguing to me. How about the U.S. Senate race then, John, between Governor well, Justice and Representative Mooney? Yeah, for all, I mean, for all sense and purposes, I mean, from what the polls say, the governor, Governor Justice is far ahead in that race. Uh, Governor Justice, uh, you know, he, he, he seems to really have a, a hold on the state of West Virginia, and he really, you know, doesn't do any wrong in the eyes of West Virginians. I think he could probably be indicted for something, and he would still win the race. He just really has that whatever it is. I'm not sure what it is that politicians have that, that are very popular politicians, but Governor Justice seems to have that. Hey, John, without picking winners or losers, what is the impact of the occupant, whoever wins the governor governor's race, what is the impact of that on Berkeley County? Is there a, well, is there a direct link? A, yeah, I think as a commissioner, I mean, I, I have relationships with three of the four. I do not know Chris Miller, uh, but I have relationships with all three of them, uh, consider all three of them friends. I, I think that all of them have strengths and weaknesses. Um, as we all do, and I think that I can find common ground to work with any of them uh, to help resolve issues that are going to arise in Berkeley County with infrastructure, water, sewer, uh, roads. I mean, ro I mean, that, that, to me, that needs to be the very first question that anyone from Eastern Panhandle will ask whoever the next governor and senator is going to be is what is your plan to help the unique struggles of Eastern Panhandle with our roads because we are past the point of being reactive to our road systems uh, you know, it is time to be proactive. We need new roads. We need turn lanes. We need signals. We need uh, we need um, uh, bypasses. So it, it is really time that the state has gotten uh, proactive on the road situation in Berkeley County. Can there be a direct link between the county commission and the executive branch in Charleston? Sure, sure. I mean, there's obviously our commissioners have talked to the governor, maybe not to the governor directly, but to the governor's staff. I, Brian Abraham has always made himself available. Berkeley Bentley has always made himself uh, available. Um, uh, my, my good friend Daryl Coles, who works for the governor's office, has always made himself available for issues to county commissioners. Uh, work closely with our senators and our delegates. Uh, you know, try to get everybody in the same room. You know, West Virginia is a very small state. Everybody seems to know everybody, and and it's uh, you can really get those those meetings together and try to build those um, those relationships and try to get done what you need to get done. And that's been true through the years, John. There's been a close relationship, working relationship between the county commission and the governor's office. Yeah. I had one other thing I wanted to say about the education system, and, and this may be a little controversial, but I think some people may have some value in it. At some point in time, 
the education system is going to have to figure out that we are not going to be able to let the small percentage of students who do not want to be educated or do not want to be in schools, who do not want to be a part of the solution, are going to have to figure an alternative way to educate those students. Uh, you, we cannot let, you know, five. Per, you, we can't let five students in a class of 25 uh, unruliness and and behavior issues deter the other 20 percent of students who want to learn and the parents who are not involved in those children's lives. At some point in time, the state is going to have to make a decision to say, we are going to provide you with a free and thorough education. Uh, here is your portion of your tax dollars that you receive for your education. Now you figure out your child's education. If you want to do that at home school, if you want to send them to a private school, if you want to send them to some behavioral alternative school that maybe the state puts together. But at some point in time, we've got to be able to recognize that the students that are there to be educated, who want to better themselves, who are trying to change their station in life, are, cannot be affected by the students or the parents who are not concerned about their education. Well, it's, it, it's been true forever that the well-behaved B student without athletic skills gets lost in the education system. It's always been that way. I mean, It'd for years. True, John. John, this is a parental issue. It's not a, it's not a student issue. And, and I say that because kids are kids and, and they don't know anything, right? Uh, and you get molded as a kid based on the way your parents raise you. So when you're 12 and you're acting out, you didn't decide at the age of 12 to act out. This started from the behaviors that were around you when you were a little kid. Ex with the exception of kids that have specific issues, physical or, or, or mentally, whatever, you know, I, we can make an exception there. But by and large, parents mold the child. So this issue has to come back to the parents, which is the reason why I like your idea. Look, this is what you dropped off at school. We tried. This is your kid, not ours. We didn't make this kid this way in school. This kid came to us this way. Now, I don't like the idea of, well, you know what? They're 12, throw them out on the street. They don't want education. They don't get education because that becomes, that becomes society's problem real soon, real soon. And it's an expensive problem. And it becomes a very lifelong, continuous problem. So there's got to be an alternative school for these people. And the question is, will members of the legislature, if you can get the agreement of the Board of Education to go along with it, create that type of school? It doesn't have to be in every county because some of these small counties don't have that many kids in schools. But there's got to be some type of, for lack of a better way of putting it, central school that can take care of these kids. I know we're kind of doing something like that in, in Berkeley County. But it does have to be on a much more mass basis. Yeah, I know Berkeley County is working with the CARES Academy and trying to, to have some alternative programs. But at some point in time, there there's going to have to be an alternative education system, whether the state sets that up or if that's a private system, you know, that uses works off state dollars. However, that works. But we've got to be able to focus on the students who who want to be there. You know, I, I go back to when I was a child. I mean. Obviously, I was mischievous as any, you know, 12 or 13 year old is going to be. But I, I never really got in a lot of trouble because I feared my parents. I got in, didn't want to get in trouble because I respected my parents. I, the worst thing that my grandfather or grandmother could have said to me was that they were disappointed in me. I, I, there was that level of, of respect. You know, and I think it comes back to the breakdown of the nuclear family. It breaks down. We have a lot of children that are in fatherless homes, uh, you know, and it takes two parents to raise a child. I mean, Single mothers work hard and can do it, and single fathers work hard and do it. But, you know, it's really hard to raise a child with, as a single parent. It puts a lot of challenges on, on the parent and on the child. Uh, like I said, we, you have the breakdown of the, of the, you know, the traditional families and the values sometimes get lost in there. And, and this is, is what we're seeing. We also see the breakdown of the, of the teachers not being able to have any type of continuity of, of teachers in the schools. You know, I had the same teachers – I went to North Jefferson Elementary, and I was in the same building from kindergarten to sixth grade. I knew every teacher in that building, and, and I knew what, what was expected of me. And so I, I think it's a very, very complex issue that's going to take very um, uh, complex uh, work and details to figure out. 
John, I agree with you, but I don't think we're going to be able to come go back around to where we were when we were kids. Culture, the families changed, cultures changed so much. So it's going to be finding workarounds, work uh, so to work around these um, uh, the loss of the nuclear family. I well, excuse me. We're, we're about out of time, Bill. Okay, so that needs okay. to be at the wrap up yeah, there. Okay. John, thanks so much. A final thought from you. Hey, thank you guys very much for the opportunity. Uh, I just hope and pray that uh, the legislature, the county officials, the school boards can come together and, and figure out what's the absolute best education uh, processes and, and what is best for West Virginia students. Um, you know, an educated population and a good job fixes a lot of problems, and I think that's the direction we need to continue to move in. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, John. Delegate.